The Sony NEX7 is the most feature-rich and most expensive camera out of the Sony NEX line. However, its biggest feature is also its biggest flaw. Let's get into it. What's going on? In this video, I'm reviewing the Sony NEX7. This is my most anticipated review on this channel. I have a bunch of people asking me for it. It's finally here. And for my video users, I even took this camera out on a video shoot last week and use it as a B camera with my Sony FS7. So it's gonna be pretty interesting taking a look at some of the footage and comparing the FS7, which is a professional cinema camera, to the NEX7, which is a budget mirrorless camera at this point. Literally 97% of you aren't subscribed. So real quick, let's change that. Go down, hit the like button and subscribe and let's get right into it. At the time of its release, the NEX7 had the best image quality out of any mirrorless camera. And this camera even won multiple awards because of just how good it was. The NEX7 has a 24 megapixel APS-C size sensor. It can shoot photos at up to 10 frames a second. It has a built-in flash. It shoots 1080p video at up to 60 frames a second. It has Sony's amazing E-mount, an external mic input, a partially articulating screen, a 2.4 million dot electronic viewfinder, and it only weighs 12 and a half ounces. So the NEX7 was released in 2011, 10 years ago, but it still has the same sensor size, the same megapixels, the same screen and viewfinder resolution, and basically the same burst rate as the Sony a6400, which is an eight year newer camera. So just by looking at the specs, the NEX7 has almost the same photography specs and resolution and features as the A6400, which makes this camera an insane value for the price. However, this camera definitely still has some quirks. Before we get into those, I'm gonna go ahead and show you the photography specs of this camera and then show you some photos I've taken with it. So like I said, this has very, very similar photography specs to the A6400 and most of Sony's newer cameras. So it can take great looking, sharp 24 megapixel photos in RAW and JPEG, just like all of Sony's newer APS-C mirrorless cameras. Now, one of the things I mentioned that this actually does better than Sony's A6400 is that it has three programmable dials. So when you're shooting in manual mode, you of course have your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed. So three different settings to change around and dial in for you know whatever picture you wanna take. And so the A6400 has, of course, the spinning dial right here in the front, and then it has one on the top, so you can change you know, your ISO or your shutter speed with one and your aperture or whatever else with the other one. But in order to change the third option, you need to actually like, go into the menu or press a button first and then spin it to you know, change the third setting. However, the NEX7 actually has two programmable dials at the top here and then the rotating selection dial. So you don't have to go into any settings or any menus or anything like that. You can literally change all three of the main settings right from these dials, which is super easy, makes it super fast to change any settings like that. And it's just one of those things that isn't a game changer, but it really just adds to the usability of this camera. So pretty much when it comes to photography, there really isn't much to talk down about. This camera takes 24 megapixel photos, which is still a great resolution. That's what all of Sony's APS-C cameras still are. And they're professional cameras. You know, people use the A6400 and A6500 and A6600 in professional environments. So 24 megapixels is still a great amount. It shoots photos at 10 frames a second, which isn't as good as some other professional cameras like the A9 or like the 1DX Mark III, which are meant for sports photography. But that being said, 10 frames a second is still good enough for most things. And it's better than way more expensive Canon cameras even, like the Canon RP and I think even the EOS R. And also having a built-in flash is better than a lot of other cameras that come out nowadays as well. However, one thing to take note of is the color science. So Sony's older color science has had a lot of negativity around it and Definitely for the right reasons. I've actually talked about it in my last video about the Sony A6000, which also had Sony's older color science. All of the photos and videos that come out of Sony's older cameras just have this really weird, like greenish, yellowish tint. It really doesn't look good and it's kind of hard to fix in editing, especially for videos. Of course, if you shoot photos in RAW, it's gonna be a lot easier to you know, fix this and make it look better. However, it's definitely just a big flaw with Sony's older cameras, including the NEX7. And then one more thing to note is if you use external flashes and that sort of thing, this doesn't have a regular hot shoe. This has Sony's proprietary interface shoe. I don't know exactly what it's called. It's really weird, but you can get an adapter to turn this into a regular hot shoe. It's just gonna add an extra thing on top of your camera and it's kind of weird. But I just wanna mention that too, if you have flashes that you use, they're probably not gonna work with this unless you get an adapter. 
which I'll go ahead and link the adapter down in the description. It's made specifically from Sony, so it's gonna work great. It's just really weird to have to attach that to the top of your camera in order to even use a regular flash. And then the last thing to note with photography is of course the ISO performance. So it's no surprise that older cameras are gonna have worse ISO and worse low light performance. So I did an ISO test where I went outside with a kind of nice high contrast scenario. This picture isn't meant to look good, it's just a nice high contrast picture to really see where the ISO starts to break down. And so I took a picture at every single ISO from 100 to 16,000. So let's go over to Lightroom, look at these images and pretty much see where the highest ISO is without getting a crazy amount of noise. All right, so I'm here in Adobe Lightroom and I have a bunch of photos of the exact same thing uh, that put the NEX7 on a tripod. And I took a picture with every single ISO setting from 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12,800, and then finally 16,000 ISO, which is the highest ISO. And so I took raw photos. Uh, in video, it's gonna be a little different, but it will be fairly similar in terms of you know, the higher the ISO, the more grain, and it's gonna be similar grain. But like I said, I took raw photos of all these. None of these are edited. There's no noise reduction. There's no sharpening. And so for this, I used the Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4 lens, which is a very sharp lens. I shot it at F2.8. And so I have an ND filter in front. So all I did to get the exact same exposure with all these photos is change the shutter speed. And then of course the ISO. So the aperture is the same every time. Now also this picture isn't meant to look pretty at all. It actually is kind of an ugly picture of our garage. However, it does have really high contrast. There's a shadow, there's some plants for high detail segments. So starting out, this is of course ISO 100. So you can see there's not really much noise. I can zoom in right here in this kind of darker area right here. And there's really not a lot of noticeable noise. It's gonna be kind of hard to tell with YouTube's compression. However, I'm gonna do the best I can to uh, you know explain what everything looks like. And so if we say zoomed in here, kind of right on this area here, which is a dark shadow area. Let's go over to ISO 200. So there we go. There's kind of back and forth, 100, 200, 100, 200. Um, I can see a little, little bit of increased noise. However, when I zoom out, there's no way to be able to tell without zooming in pixel peeping, which typically, especially if you're seeing this on a phone screen or something like that, you'd never ever notice that. So if we go over to 400 ISO, again, zoomed out like this, I can kind of tell a little bit in that shadow area. In the highlight area, there's no way I couldn't tell at all. But in that shadow area, just I can kind of notice a little more. So let's go back, zoom in on there. I'm gonna go from 400 to 100 now. So this is 400, that's 100. So you can kind of tell a little bit, zoomed in like that. You, know, you can start to see a little bit of noise, a little bit of colored noise, which kind of looks ugly zoomed in like this. Once you zoom out, again, there's, it's, not gonna be really noticeable. Let's go over to 800. So again, there's a little bit of an increase. Let's go back to from 800 to 100 and look at it. So zoomed out, that's where you can kind of start to tell. If you look on the left side, like over here, watch that, that's 100 and then there's 800. It kind of starts to, you know, see that uh, colored noise and that kind of like green noise that goes in there, that's 100. So zoomed in, you can definitely tell there's quite a bit of noise there. However, it's not super bad yet. Again, zoomed out, you might notice it, but especially once you edit this photo and crush the blacks a little bit, you know, like do some editing, it's gonna pretty much cover it up. You won't notice it a lot. However, you can, you know, if you look for it, you can see there's some noise there. But still in the bright areas, I really don't think you'd ever notice it. You know, in the sky, I mean, you can kind of see it there in a flat area. Over here, no, there's no way. You, you can never see it in the grass or anything like that. So 1600, again, over here, you can definitely start to see it a lot more. I mean, that's that's pretty visible now in all the shadow areas. Right here, it's still not as noticeable in like these because there's a lot more detail, um, but you can notice it. And in the sky, you can definitely see that. Again, I don't know about with YouTube compression. Make sure you're watching this in 4K to get the lowest compression, but on my computer screen, I can definitely tell this. But again, it doesn't look super terrible yet. It's not super noisy. It's more of like grain. So you can kind of see a little bit of like colors in here, um, but it's nothing crazy yet. So go over to 3200. And this is where it starts to get a lot worse. So again, here there's 3200, there's 100. 3200, you can see it just kind of flattens everything out. You know, you start to like lose detail. It's really like, it's almost yellow and green, like especially like look at that right there. That's 3200, that's 100. So it's just, 
definitely adds a lot of noise, flattens everything out, just makes it look a lot worse. The sky especially, you can tell. However, in the bright areas and like detailed areas, it's still not as noticeable. Zoomed in, you can kind of tell. Zoomed out, you really can't tell like in the grass there. You really don't see anything yet, which is which is really good. However, you know, most scenes there's gonna be contrast like this. There's gonna be darker areas where you're gonna see a lot like that and it's just not gonna look that good. Going over to 6400, that's where you start to see the colorful, you know, the colorful noise and grain in there. You can see it's green, there's yellow, there's like a little bit of like red or purple. It's just all over the place. And this is where it really starts to break down. You know, over here you can really see it. Even like the lighter part of the trees here. And the lighter part of the leaves here, you can see it as well. Um, you know, still in the grass here, something like that's not as noticeable. So there's 6400. There's 100. If you look in the grass here, you really can't tell a whole lot. Um, but once you get over here, you can really see it. So that's where it starts to really break down the image. I mean, this just doesn't even look that good, even zoomed all the way out. Then of course, 12,800, even more of a color shift. I mean, this is all just green and yellow and looks so gross. Sky doesn't look good. It just starts to grading sharpness a bunch. I mean, that just starts to look really bad. Then of course, 16,000 is the worst out of them all. This just looks bad. I mean, you, this is definitely not usable no matter what. Even in daylight like this, it's just so noisy, so grainy, it just does not look good. So, I think, uh, for me personally, of course, if you want to use this image, you could. Like, you can use whatever eyes so you think works for you. Um, for me, I think the highest I'd feel comfortable going is 800 before I start to, you know, see a noticeable amount of noise. So 800, I think, is the point where there's a little bit of noise in the shadows, um, but in like the sky like this, you can barely notice it, especially zoomed out. Bright areas, you can't notice it, stuff like that. I think 800 is probably a good safe spot. If you really need to, you can push it further, but I think 800 is really the maxed out point in terms of getting a really clean image. And of course, at the end of the day, you're gonna get the cleanest image possible with 100 ISO. So if you can, try to stay at 100 or the lowest you possibly can, but like I said, 800, is pretty much the max that I feel comfortable pushing this camera while still trying to get a nice, sharp, you know, fairly noise-free image. So when it comes to autofocus, the NEX7 is definitely much slower than any new camera is, which is completely understandable when you realize that this is a 10-year-old camera. It doesn't have, you know, Sony's fast image processors that they have in their newer cameras, and it just has older technology in general. So if you just keep in mind that this camera doesn't have very fast autofocus, it definitely won't bother you, and it's perfectly usable for any sort of still objects or even slowly moving objects. Just nothing for like sports or anything that's like running around like wildlife. I wouldn't trust it for that. However, one of the amazing uses for old mirrorless cameras like this is adapting vintage lenses to it, which is what I do most of the time with these old NEX cameras. And when you adapt those old vintage lenses, there's no autofocus as it is, so you're gonna have to manual focus and adjust the aperture manually. If you're gonna use vintage lenses for that, autofocus doesn't matter as it is, but definitely keep in mind that it's not gonna be anything up to par with any new camera. So in terms of video, the NEX7 can record up to 1080p video at 24, 30, and 60 frames a second. Now it records this video at 4208 bit, so there's really nothing spectacular here. It doesn't record video at a very high bit rate or bit depth or anything like that. It's pretty basic 1080p video at up to 60 frames a second. And also it doesn't shoot log or anything like that. You're gonna have customizable picture profiles, which I usually go into the standard one and turn sharpness, saturation, and contrast down a little bit just to get a video file that's easier to work with in color grade. But it records 8-bit video, so it's nothing that you can really push and post and really color grade heavily. It's gonna start to break down, and overall it's just average video. Uh, 1080p is still good enough depending on what you shoot, but it doesn't do 4K, uh, it doesn't record super high bit rates, anything like that, it's just standard 1080p video. And it's also pretty much the same video specs of any other Sony NEX camera, like the NEX5N, the NEX5R, 5T, 6. Those cameras, which are like half the price of this, record pretty much the exact same video specs. So definitely keep that in mind as well. And so like I said, I took this camera on a video shoot as a B camera with my FS7. And it actually intercut surprisingly well. I was shooting in log on the FS7 in 1080p, so I didn't shoot in 4K, I shot in 1080p to make it a little easier to intercut these cameras. However, what I talked about before with the weird color science on Sony's older cameras definitely came into play with this, and it was really hard to match the video files. The FS7 just looked amazing, it looked really natural, really good, but then when I got the NEX7 footage in there and looked at the skin colors in that, they just looked really weird and just didn't look right. 
especially being back to back with the FS7. So it really took a lot of messing with the image, messing with color grading. Even at the end, I don't think they match up perfect. I'm not a professional color grader or anything like that, but I think I was able to get them close enough to be acceptable. Um, but it was definitely a big issue trying to get them to match because of the weird color science in the NEX7. But I'll go ahead and show some side-by-side -side clips and just show you some of the footage from the video shoot I was on with the NEX7 and the FS7. And I'll put down at the bottom which camera it is and you can kind of see them back to back and really judge the image quality on your own. It's definitely, like I said, average 1080p video quality. It shoots good video and you know if you have the right settings and you know, the right lighting and everything like that you can definitely get some good video quality out of it. Which I'm actually going to be making a video soon about how to get cinematic video with NEX cameras and just any older mirrorless cameras like this. So if you're interested in checking that out go hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for that. But anyways here's some side by side footage between the FS7 and the NEX7. All right, so now it's time to get into the quirks of the Sony NEX7. So this camera has quite a few quirks to note. Um, there's maybe a few that are gonna be deal breakers, but a lot of them are just little things that pretty much most old mirrorless cameras like this are gonna have. So even though it's kind of a long list, this is just stuff that I want you to know before you buy this camera, just in case something's more important to you. But I really don't think most of these are deal breakers, especially when you keep in mind that this is a 10 year old camera. So first of all, this camera can overheat pretty quick. So while I was on that video shoot, I was actually in kind of a confined space. It was a really, really hot day. I think it was almost 90 degrees out. However, I used an external dummy battery. So it was an NPF adapter and it basically has a dummy battery that goes into the camera. And so what that does is essentially stop some of the heat buildup in this camera because the battery is the main thing that gets really hot. So with a dummy battery like that, the actual battery is outside of the camera. And so with that, with that dummy battery, it never ended up overheating. I did get a high heat warning, but it never shut off on me. And that was about a two hour shoot. I was recording on and off, so it wasn't consistently recording, but it was still a very, very hot day. And I was pretty surprised it didn't overheat because with the regular battery in this camera, it overheated at about 20 minutes. So that can definitely be an issue if you're gonna be recording long videos with this. However, it does have a 30 minute record limit. So after 30 minutes, you have to stop recording anyways. But it overheated even before that on about a 75 degree day. It was pretty much a normal temperature. There wasn't any crazy stuff. The screen was in, so I didn't have the screen out, which that would help a little bit. But it was basically just a normal temperature. It overheated in about 20 minutes. So definitely think about if that's an issue for you. If you're recording long videos where you need to record for the full 30 minutes, stop and then start recording right again afterwards. This overheating can definitely be an issue if you don't use a dummy battery. But if you're just recording little b-roll segments or if this is a B camera where you're not using it, continuously just for little segments. That's not really gonna be an issue for you and you know the 20 minute record limit before it overheats will just be a little quirk that won't even bother you at all. So just keep that in mind, it'll overheat um, in around 20 minutes. Of course, it'll be different depending on how hot or cold it is, if there's a breeze, maybe even what frame rate you're shooting in or if you have a manual lens or an autofocus lens, all that will definitely change this a little bit. All right, so I'm just gonna run through a few more and then I'm gonna get to the biggest feature slash quirk of this camera. Uh, the NEX7 has a very cluttered menu system. Uh, that's another big complaint with older Sony cameras. Their menus are just so cluttered and just so weirdly designed that it's just hard to get to a specific thing that you need. Uh, so that's another thing on the NEX7. You know, if you need to get to a certain setting, it'll take a while of just sorting through the menu, finding what page it's on before you can actually get to the right one. Also, like I said earlier, it has Sony's older color science, which just isn't very good. It has fairly slow autofocus. I kind of brought that up already. Uh, it doesn't have a regular hot shoe. And last but not least, like I stated earlier, this does have an external mic input. And so that is the biggest thing that this camera has that any other Sony NEX camera doesn't have. That's the biggest reason why I wanted to get this camera over the other NEX cameras and why a lot of people want this camera. 
because of the external mic input. This is basically Sony's only APS-C camera before the A6000 that has a mic input. None of the NEX cameras have it. The A6000 doesn't have it. You have to go all the way up to the A6300 to get a mic input. And at that point, you're paying like twice as much. So it's safe to say the mic input is a huge feature of this camera. However, Sony didn't add adjustable gain for the mic input. So this might not sound like a big deal. However, typically when you plug an external mic in, you dial in the gain so that it stays pretty much the exact same. So that, you know, whatever's a certain volume will stay that volume and, you know, just it's just easy, it's simple, and it works. You can do that in the NEX7. The NEX7 is still just gonna adjust the gain on its own to make whatever it hears a normal volume. And so here's why this is not good at all and why this is a pretty big issue. So obviously the reason you plug in an external microphone is to get good audio quality. But when you plug an external microphone into this, you start recording and you start talking, it's gonna adjust to make your voice normal, which is good. But as soon as you stop talking or uh, if you talk quieter or something like that, it'll keep adjusting it to make sure whatever it's hearing is like a higher volume. So for example, if you're talking and then you stop talking, it's just gonna keep pushing the gain up. You'll just hear all the background noise. It'll sound really bad. And then as soon as you start talking again, it'll kind of quick adjust it back down so your voice is normal. Um, or if you whisper, it'll bring it back up again. It'll just try to keep everything at the same level, which is not good because it adds a lot more uh, background noise, a lot more hiss into your audio and it just doesn't sound very good. So I'm actually gonna show you a comparison right now. I'm gonna keep recording with this, and then I'm gonna record with the NEX7, and it's gonna go back and forth and show you what I'm talking about here, where it just tries to keep everything the same volume and just adds so much more hiss and background noise and just makes it sound very bad. All right, this is an audio test with the Sony NEX7. I have the Rode Wireless Go plugged into it with Rode's lavalier mic. So it's a good setup. The audio normally sounds pretty good, like on what you just saw, I use the exact same setup. And this, I have the gain turned down on the Rode Wireless Go. And then of course I can't adjust the gain at all in the NEX7. Uh, so this is an audio test. I'm gonna kind of get quiet, loud, and then I'll go silent and just show you kind of what it sounds like. All right, so right now I'm talking pretty quiet. This is not a whisper, but just really quiet. All right, so now I'm talking normal. This is what I, basically the exact same volume I was talking in uh, with what you just saw in the A6400 in the regular video. This is pretty much the same volume. All right, so now I'm talking a little bit louder. This is what it sounds like with just a louder talking volume. And then now I'm gonna go completely silent and just let it run for a little bit. And now I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the built-in mics on the NEX7 and just show you what that sounds like as well. All right, so this is the built-in mic on the Sony NEX7. I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'll talk in a quiet voice, normal voice, and then a loud voice, and then I'll go completely silent and just show you what the background noise hiss sounds like. All right, so I'm talking quiet right now. Uh, like I said, this is above a whisper, but you know, just talking quiet. All right, so this is talking normally, just like I did in the previous video. Um, just normal volume, normal voice, everything like that. And the built-in mics on the NEX7. Of course, automatic gain because you can't adjust the gain in this camera. And now I'm talking louder. This is uh, not quite a yell, but louder talking than normal. And this is what it sounds like with the automatic gain in the NEX7. And now I'm gonna go quiet and we'll see what that sounds like. All right, so that's that. Um, that's pretty much the biggest quirk of this. I don't know why Sony couldn't just add the option to have a manual or auto gain on the input. It really does make this amazing feature on this camera just less usable and something that I wouldn't even trust using for any sort of, you know, semi-professional audio or anything that I'd want to use good audio for. It really just makes that amazing feature a lot worse and just so much less usable. So obviously they're not going to update it now. It's already a 10 year old camera. They really don't care about it anymore. So it's nothing that you can expect to be added or anything like that. It's just a big feature that they missed out on that they really just should have done from the start. And so that basically wraps up all the pros, the cons, the specs, everything about the NEX7. I'm gonna have more videos about this camera in the future, so if you're interested in that, definitely stay tuned, hit the like button, and subscribe. And that wraps this video up. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.